depression was raging. I, I graduated from high school with about 100,000 other kids in New York. There were no jobs. But the good jobs around at that time were civil service jobs, if you could. So I took every examination that I could, policeman, fireman, post, post office. And an, uh, an examination was offered for apprentice at the Brooklyn Navy Yard because the Navy was beginning to build these ships. And uh, I applied, and I took the exam with 4,000 other kids from New York, and 300 of us got a perfect score, and I was one of them, and I was hired. And we were put to work building the ships. The Iowa, at that time, the sister ship of the New Jersey, the first one in the group, was just beginning, the, the, just working on the very, very bottom. And I came to work there in October of 1939, and uh, started to work as an apprentice, making $14.89 a week, and uh, living it up in, in New York. Um, being a, uh, an apprentice, we worked on all parts of the ship and were given excellent training. We went to school and uh, worked on uh, all the different sections on the turrets on the bottom over the, over the period that I was there. And of course, uh, because we were necessary to the war effort, I had a deferment. I didn't have to go into the service. Uh, when Pearl Harbor came, uh, the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th, 1941, uh, I, things at the Navy Yard picked up and we began working 60 hours a week. S six day week, 10 hours a day, because we wanted to get these ships built. So I was working a 10 hour day out in the cold on the ships right down on the East River in New York and going to school at night studying engineering. Well, I did that and I had a deferment so I could stay out of the service. I didn't do it to stay out, but uh, I was necessary to the war effort. As the war progressed and as the ships were completed, the deferments began to end. So in 1943, I enlisted, volunteered to go into the Air Corps. It was the Air Corps then, not the Air Force. And uh, uh, because I had an engineering background and uh, uh, I was in very, very good health, good school record and all that, I was accepted as uh, for pilot training. And I was sent down to uh, San Antonio, Texas and uh, uh, into pre-flight training and uh, I flew Piper Cubs out in Ohio. They started us off on very, very small planes, giving us a lot of classroom training and giving us actual air training too. And uh, I found out how uh, much fun and how risky um, flying could be because uh, while I got through the war un untouched, I lost several buddies who crashed planes or who were killed during the war and things like that. Well, I uh, completed my pilot training and when I, just the luck of the draw, when I completed it, they had too many pilots. So the Army sent me to navigation school that kept me back in the States some more, just the way it worked out. And I was sent to Selman Field, Monroe, Louisiana, where the biggest navigation school in the country was being held, and I became a navigator. And in uh, 1943, I was given a commission, lieutenant in the Air Force. These wings are the wings I got when I was commissioned, signed by President Roosevelt. And uh, I was assigned to a bomb group, a B-29 bomb group, operating in Walker, Kansas. The B-29 was an immense plane. It was the biggest airplane in the world at that time. And uh, I uh, was a navigator and I was also a radar operator. I had a, a radar equipment that was never used during the war. It was equipment that could see targets 300 miles away in all kinds of weather. Well, in any event, uh, I, went, I, I was assigned to this group and uh, trained in how to use radar. And uh, then I get orders to go to Boca Raton, Florida, because they had developed some new radar equipment and I was down there for a couple of months learning how to do that, flying two or three days a week. I have thousands of hours of, of flying time in. And uh, then back to the bomb group again. And uh, we're just almost ready to go and I get orders again to go out to Victorville, California. There was another radar set operate, uh, uh, piece of equipment that had been developed, and I had to be trained on that. 
And uh, by the time I got back, uh, the war was grinding to an end. Um, I finally wound up in a, uh, with, with my entire group in Harrington, Kansas in August of 1945. And we were all ready to go overseas. We were going to go over to the island of Tinian. Our orders were already cut. Our equipment had gone over in April of 1945 by ship. So that it would be waiting there for us, our, our, our equipment, my footlocker, uniforms and everything. And I managed to get six bottles of booze, which was very, very hard to get at that time. And I had that packed into my clothing and all of that went over. Well, we were supposed to go, but in, later in August when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, the war ended, our orders were canceled, and I was sent back to Grand Island, Nebraska. Uh, Grand Island, Nebraska was where we sat and waited until our time came to be discharged. So I had a very, very lucky war. Uh, I had a couple of uh, close shaves. The B-29 was a very, very unusual plane. It was built to fly several thousand miles with a very, very heavy bomb load from islands like Tinian and Iwo Jima to Japan and back. There was no place in the middle to stop and get a Starbucks. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, the planes were light and very, very uh, highly technical. The engines were made out of magnesium. Magnesium is a very light metal. However, unfortunately, it has a low burning point, and if the engines got too hot, the engines would catch fire, and that was our biggest worry. You'd be flying with four engines, and all of a sudden one of them would begin to smoke, and you were flying with three engines, or possibly two. We had one very, very close call uh, when we were flying down in the South Atlantic. We had taken off out of Batista Field in Cuba, flying on a submarine patrol, and uh, we were out over the water on a very, very bad day. Couldn't see anything for a hundred miles. Um, just rainy, stormy day. And uh, our navigator, or one of our engines started to burn. The pilot called to the navigator and said, give me a heading back to the base. And the navigator hadn't been able to set up a plot. He didn't know where we were. But there was I with my kooky radar set and uh, I could see the field and everything like that and uh, uh, the pilot called to the navigator again, get us back to the field. The pilot couldn't answer so uh, I called over the intercom and told the pilot to take a heading and start letting down immediately and he did and two minutes later we broke through the clouds and the field was right ahead of us. We landed with two engines of fire and fire engines racing down, Not yeah, Fire engines and ambulances racing down alongside of us. Uh, we all got out of the plane and 15, minutes, 15 seconds later it blew up, but we were all safe and uh, that was uh, one of the close calls. Other, other than that though, I, I came through. I didn't have to kill anybody and nobody got any shots at me. I did my duty. I, uh, I'm still very, very much involved. Uh, I, I have a son who's going over to Iraq in July. I'm still very much involved with uh, the Navy. I'm a docent on the ship here. I'm wearing my docent's uh, uniform. And uh, you just can't get me away from this stuff. It's not that I'm a warmonger or anything, but this is such an integral part of my life that I, I want to continue it as long as I can. This is a wonderful country, and I think that it's up to us to keep it, to defend it, and to keep it that way.